Hi everyone, I'm Bolu and I am an independent AI researcher. And today I'm going to talk about using Python for large language models research. Um, specifically, I'll be speaking on the NNSight Python library to, that enables mechanistic interpretability research. So a bit of a primer on this field of um, inquiry. What is mechanistic interpretability? Some things we can hopefully all agree on. First is that neural networks solve an increasing number of important tasks. Um, and the second is that it would be at least interesting and probably important to understand how they do. That is interesting in the sense of, if you feel any sense of curiosity to basically look inside this whole world that is currently a black box to most people, um, just out of your, because these models arrive at solutions that no person could write a program for. So out of curiosity, it'd be interesting to know um, what are the algorithms being implemented uh, and hopefully um, describing them in a human understandable way. And important in a sense that any sufficiently powerful system that is being put um, in strategic places of great importance in society um, has to have a certain level of transparency and understanding before we as a society can trust it to be deployed. Any effort to understand how um, these models work um, will definitely be continue to be increasingly important in the future. Now, mechanistic inter interpretability or mechinterp, as I'll call it going forward, because as you can imagine, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, is a field of research that tackles this problem starting at a very granular level um, of the models. Uh, what does that mean by granular level? The typical mechanistic interpretability result um, provides a mechanistic model. That basically means a causal model describing how different discrete components in a very large model arrive at some observed behavior. So you have some observed behavior, and the question is, can you, through experimental processes, arrive at an explanation for how these observations come to be? That is the mechanistic approach to it. Again, this is identifying mechinterp in a much larger field of interpretability, which can have um, different flavors to it. But me mechanistic interpretability is unique in taking this granular causal model of trying to drill as deep as possible and hoping to build on um, larger and larger abstraction, but starting from the very granular level. Um, and for today's talk, we're going to be picking one item out of the mechinterp toolkit, which is that of causal interventions. So basically the idea is if we abstract the entire network uh, to be a computational graph, that is again, we forget that this is you know machine learning, just imagine this as being any abstract computational graph and the current state of not understanding is simply means we don't know what computation each of the nodes are running and how they interact with each other. So from that perspective, if we're curious about knowing how one component, that is either it is an attention head or a linear, an MLP layer or a linear layer or an embedding unit. Again, you don't have to worry about any of these means. You can just abstract these as being any node in some compute graph. But if you do, it'll help to um, paint a picture better. So if we're curious to know what any of these nodes contributes, one way or, or to start with, even knowing if they contribute anything to start with, um, one way of doing that is simply taking the node and observing some behavior that we find interesting and then changing the input to that node to see if the downstream impact for the observed behavior is noteworthy. That is, if this node in this example, the node D, is, so, is very vital to some observed behavior downstream, if we mess with it a bit, that's if we perturb the node, the observed result should change. That means that, okay, this node is on the critical path from input to output for this observed behavior. Of course, we expect you know, the, some part of the model to change if you mess with anything. But the whole point of this is that we have to, first of all, settle on some observed behavior. And then we tweak that the value of some node of interest. And then we observe downstream. If, however, it doesn't have any impact, then that means this node is not that important. And then we can ignore it. But if it is, then we know that we can drill deeper. So I think in the rest of the, of the course, I'm going to speak on a practical example in very recent research that uses this kind of intervention to, to try to understand how a model achieves some outcomes. The topic of interest today is that of function vectors. So this is a very recent paper, I think just published last year, October, 
from a group from Northeastern University, from Corgi College, from Corgi College of Computer Science. Basically, it is a mechanistic interoperability research effort that tries to observe some behavior in large language models. Um, and that behavior is described thus. So the question is the hypothesis, is it possible to have some functional components of large language models? That is, we, we can all agree that for, if I gave, looking at the top left section here of a string of input, that is arrive, colon, depart, small, colon, big, common, colon, dot, dot, dot. If I gave this input to something like, say, chat GPT, I think we could all agree that it will figure out, okay, this is a simple word and opposite game. That is the first example at the top. And the second example, I believe, is converting to Spanish. Um, I think we can all agree that um, chat, something like ChatGPT and similar um, large language models are able to do such a thing. Is it possible for me to take some kernel of this function of opposite, say again, taking the first example, and transfer it to a completely different context and have that same behavior operate on a token in this new context. What that means is on the, on the right, you see the direction of the arrow. The example, the counterpart on the right simply says the word fast means dot, dot, dot. Now, under the normal operation of a large language module, model trying to predict the next token, you can say something like the word fast means quick or it means going quickly or any reasonable thing to follow. However, if we're able, if this hypothesis of portability of functions, we should be able to move something from this context on the left that clearly is about word and opposite into a completely new context that has no um, conception of word and opposite as an objective and achieve the result of flipping the word fast into slow. I know it, it's, it seems very, um, almost crazy to expect this is true, but let's just assume this is the leading hypothesis. Um, and of course, we're going to discuss what exactly this thing will be exporting is. Um, we see there the letter A, average layer activa activation. What the hypothesis says is this thing, in quote, that will be, we plan to port over is simply the, act the average activation over a series of prompts for a given task. Again, we're going to break that down a bit. So again, let's say our task is simple word and opposite. So we have three different um, examples, old, young, vanish, appear, dark, colon, dot, dot, dot. And I guess something like bright or dark and light will follow. And the second example, the same thing, awake, sleep, future, past, joy, colon, dot, dot, dot. At the very end of all these contexts, these like query um, inputs, the neural network is right on the verge of doing the thing called flip opposite the last thing I saw before my colon. So the hypothesis is if we can take that activation state and on the, in the section B you see there, simply add it to a completely unrelated context, would it be possible to observe the same behavior? Because again, on the right, we see here simple, in the absence of this intervention, we have no reason to expect the model will say anything other than simple, then something like simple, easy, or whatever the model finds appropriate for to follow simple. But if indeed our intervention is important, we expect to observe something like simple, colon, complex, or at the bottom there, encode becomes decode just magically by intervening with this average um, activation state. Again, I'm going to explain what we mean by activation state in the following line, but I hope you can just get the general thesis of what this is going to be. That is, is there a, the question is, is there a portable component of, um, of operations and functions inside of neural networks, and more specifically, large language models? All right, so I guess to give a bit of shape, what I mean by activation vector and what is being ported left and right. So here, this is just like a typical one layer um, example of, of a, an LLM decoder only. What we have here is at the very bottom, we input a token, a sequence of tokens, right? That is like the on, colon, off, wet, colon, dry, old, colon. Um, and as we see, the expectation is as this input passes through subsequent layers in 
there's one single set of vectors that are going to keep being updated and changed and added on. And again, due to some specifics to the neural network um, architectures, more specifically the skip connections, which I won't get too much into right now, each subsequent layer adds additional context that is literally just added on, on top of the last. But in any way, that's not really important for now. So let's just think of it, for example, again, looking at the journey of the column, the very last um, column, when it goes to the embedding layer, it has some um, vector to represent. Okay, cool. This is how the vector, the neural network embedding layer represents the token of a column. And again, all to, so we can kind of anthropomorphize, um, pretend it's like self-aware almost to say, I am a column. Because technically, if you took that embedding um, vector and you put it through the unembedding vector, on the other side, it would come out as colon is really likely to come, right? So we might as well just see this as the, as the model being what information the model has for that position in the sequence. So somewhere between starting from I am a colon in the beginning to the very end of the thing that follows me is the word new. The model has learned some interesting things, right? By definition, like how else would it know? So in, again, because it's still that same um, column vector that is being updated for the sequence position of the token column. Um, so the conjecture here for the hypothesis of like portable functions is that somewhere in between or containing that vector is information on I'm a column, of course, which is it had before. And it also has my next is new. That is my next token is the word new, which again is just what we would observe from ChatGPT. So the additional thing the hypothesis is saying is that, or is asking is that, is there a component that encodes the operation that it must do or the function it must do to arrive at new? Perhaps before it came to the conclusion of the next is new, is there a component that says I am to do or I am to call the function opposite on, or surely there must be of some sort because how else would it know like to come up with new? But the question is if, there is linearity to this representation. Um, by li linearity is just what allows us to do things like this. Literally take a thing, add it, average, and add it somewhere else and have it do things, right? This assumes a lot of linear behavior. So this is kind of the um, underlying implicit assumption that is guiding this you know, hypothesis to start with. Um, many, many of the different like research inquiries like, like leads to very interesting result. Um, often start with this assumption of, can we assume there's a lot of linearity? And again, due to details of the architecture of most um, transformer neural networks, you know, there are, exp there are reasons to expect there to be a lot of linearity, but just to see it um, happen for real is always interesting. Um, and I think this is the first time we're seeing it in the context of operations, as again, just representations, which I think all the research has demonstrated before, um, such as, for example, the relationship between the word car and cars, that is a relationship between a word and its plural. There's been some regularities observed in, in that regard. But this, however, is trying to, is taking it a step further to say, okay, are there encodings also for functions? Okay, so we have a rough idea of what it means for, for what this H is. It's simply just some vector that at the very end of the network, um, or right before it goes into, you know, the penultimate layer or the penultimate layer, um, we could run our model three different times and snatch that vector across all of them, look at exactly what, like read literally what that vector is saying. Um, because again, the information on what is to come next is embedded in the colon token, right? So it's the thing that is, is saying, okay, dark, dot, dot, dot. So all the information for what is after dot, dot, dots is in colon. Cool. So we take that for different runs and we average it out and try to add. Um, so that gives you an idea of, you know, just to put um, draw a bit of a picture to it. Um, and of course, this is just restating the same thing. Um, now that we have an idea of like what H means and what like that vector is. So for each of the different runs in, um, in a series of prompts that are basically doing the same task, if we literally took all the values of the vectors, average them in position, added, divided by the, the, this, unified average out mean vector. And we took it into a different environment into a different context. And we literally just added it to something else. 
The question is, will we be able to get effects like seen below? That is, if we took, so I think here in the example, you see the representation for encode. Again, so encode, colon, dot, dot, dot. So this is, so there you can see how we can presume that without this intervention at the end after this token goes through the entire model, it might say something like uh, the thing to come after the colon is base64, I guess, because maybe encoding and base64 is something that shows up often, right? Remember, um, the base function of a large language model is just to predict the next most likely thing um, in, in human generated text. Um, however, with the addition of our supposed, our hypothetical average out opposite function, um, would we be able to um, steer it towards saying something like, actually, instead of saying encode base 64, I, I all of a sudden feel the urge to say the opposite of encode and just say encode column decode. This is the hypothesis. Um, so again, it would be super interesting and kind of weird if uh, we can indeed prove this. Representation, for example, that just has one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, our vector just has about six different um, dimensions encoding it. Of course, as we know, actual large language models can be much bigger than this um, in the billions and billions of parameters. So how exactly do we plan to do this multiple runs and extracting values and averaging them and intervening and adding them in the real world, not for a toy model. Um, and that brings us to our trusted interpretability libraries and packages. That is, these are packages that are designed solely for this purpose of staring very deep into um, what large language models of different sizes are up to um, in a way that is practical to enable this kind of research. Um, so we have an insight, which is um, particularly popular for working with models on the larger side. And I'll discuss um, the details of his architecture that afford um, this kind of behavior. Then we have Transformer Lens, um, which is also a, a, very, a very great open source library for doing this. But for today's work, we're going to focus on an insight. So what is, what is it about an insight that makes it work? Um, what is the context of an insight? Where did it come from? Um, to my understanding, the nInsight um, package came along with an effort called um, the NDIF um, initiative, which is basically a national deep inference facility. Um, this is basically a compute cluster that is available to researchers for doing work that cannot afford um, the financial burden of actually, you know, running these very large models because they're very costly. Um, forget just training, even just running inference on them is quite expensive. So basically you have this remote, you know, um, cluster of compute that has been made available to researchers. And the NNSight package was basically made as a point um, of like as an interface to this compute cluster. So the typical workflow as is seen here in this um, schematic is that you have the worker, the researcher working locally, basically writing interventions for how they want to run their experiments and intervene with that work, which we are going to see. And this is basically changed into a compute graph or more specifically an intervention graph. As like, this is how I want the running of this very large model to um, be tweaked. And this is then sent over the network into this cluster to say, okay, cool, please run this 70 billion model, um, 70 billion parameter model that I definitely cannot run on my M1 MacBook. And, but run it with these different interventions that make it look like, that make it no different from if I could actually run this um, locally. Um, and, as, and as you can see, the, the thing between this boundary of the local environment to the, um, NDIF infrastructure is simply this compute graph. And this compute graph is the output of the NNSight um, library. And we'll see how it does this. Cool, so like that is the motivational setup for why NNSight exists. It's basically a counterpart to the NDIF um, project, which is super interesting, by the way. Again, I think they just released their paper last November um, announcing the launch of the NDIF um, facility. It is live right now, I believe. 
Um, so yeah, um, really exciting project. I encourage anyone that's looking for computer resources for inference in particular. And that's again, this has nothing to be training. It's just like if you want to run a big model several times and do different interventions or read stuff from it to learn more, as we do with our hypothesis in in, in question, then um, it works great. But of course, um, it all, the library also offers the option of just running the if you happen to have um, you know several gigabytes of RAM to spare. Um, okay, so let's jump into the code. Um, what does it look like to do an intervention? By intervention, we just simply mean anything that either writes or reads um, execution state of our model. That is, again, you have a model, we put in a token sequence, and then stage after stage, um, the output of one stage is passed to the next, and that is added to the residual stream, which is just, again, think of it as like the this ever accumulating output of each component in the model that eventually leads to a, a probability distribution or output that we observe. Um, so if we ever want to poke into it, either like use our binoculars or um, microscope to look in, that is one type of intervention. As you can see here on line five, um, again, you can ignore the stuff above, I'll explain that later, but just to dive straight into what exactly the interventions are. Again, what are the things that make up these arrows of this um, intervention graph that is being sent over, which is the whole point of this package. Um, line five, we have something that is reading. So you see model dot layers dot input is equal to something, and we we save it. Again, I'll explain why we're saving that. This giant model is not running on my collab notebook or um, my local environment, right? So it is interesting that I can indeed read what is happening on it. Um, and on line six, we have the opposite, which is me changing something in, in some other component of my model. So model the layers, so on layer 11, on a component called the MLP, I want to change its output to become zero. And again, just to remind us what all this is for, how all this relates to our hypothesis, First, we want to get the average of a bunch of runs for the task in question, which is the opposite. And then we want to append that average out value to some other um, examples that are in a different context, called like the one shot um, or the zero shot examples. That is, we've, we've not given the model any idea what we're trying to achieve. We just wanted to um, feel the urge to do the thing we wanted to do because we have added the vector. So literally, the first thing of mean is literally just a read output. That is, we want to run several times, read the average value of this vector or read the value of this vector and then average out. And then six shows us changing the value of some component. Then we want to add this average value to um, the running of the different context and see what happens. Okay, cool. So this basically is the scaffolding for what we need um, for our project. Um, so, but before we go into the code for our experiment um, and um, research in question, just, just to like decode a bit um, what exactly is happening here. Um, so one thing is that the NNSight library loves Python context, which is one of the reasons why um, I guess like yeah, Python might be a language of choice, um, but context managers are great in Python as we know, and they do take great advantage of them. Um, and the general structure of it is that, is that as, we, as we know, we're basically the code might look like the model is running locally. When I do things like save, I do edits and I do reads, but the whole point is that none of this, the model is actually isn't running right now, but when the context closes, that's like when the code execution reaches the point where we exit the uppermost context, which is here is line three runner. All the edits we've made are, or in the course of, of running, um, of being, Intervention graph is updated with all the I/O. That is all the all the reading and the writing we're doing to the model is basically just planned while in the context. And when the context is exited, this is then sent over. Right. So the model does not run until the context of the highest level, um, which in case of the runner, which is the runner context, um, is closed. Um, and for context, the invoker, again, I would encourage anyone to read the documentation, but the invoker is basically what um, 
is what is what does the writing to the graph, right? Of course, like the between the invoker and the runner, they are both like coordinating. Um, I think the runner definitely do some high level management, but the one of the um, initialization inputs to the invoker implicitly is something called a tracer. And again, you can think of the tracer as just being um, a new graph in question. As we're going to see, you can actually have construct multiple graphs inside of one runner, which we are going to see shortly. That is, you're going to have, you can say like, okay, I want to plan different experiments. And again, this fits perfectly for our use case. Since first we want to run one set of operations that runs our task um, inputs and takes the average, and another set of operations that take that average and adds it to the state of the different context examples. Um, again, that should have no idea about the task um, and then see what happens when this average vector is added to it. Um, so right, um, so the runner is the high level context manager and then each basically like um, subgraph experiment that we want to run is contained in the invoker context. Interventions, every read and write intervention, all the IOs, are what are the nodes in their of type tracing.node, which again, um, the, uh, are what inform, uh, what our entire graph is made of to start with. And I said I was gonna speak on why we need save. So again, remember that because this isn't running locally, we have to explicitly tell the model to save any value that we want to read outside of the context because the standard behavior is when the contact is exited, the model actually runs with all our interventions. But because these values are so large, we actually have to explicitly tell, okay, please, I would like you to return, you know, several hundreds of thousands of vectors, vector values to me because that is important. So that is the only reason why we can access hidden state outside of context. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to. So perhaps we just need this was just a temporary variable that we didn't have to use for our computation, which is fine if we if we have no intention to access it after um, the contact closes, we wouldn't put save. So this is only because we want to hold on to the value. So this is just one of the examples where we have to remind ourselves of the difference between running the model locally and just simply using, uh, building a, an intervention graph for a remote resource that is going to run um, immediately we leave the context. Um, and again, this is from documentation, basically showing, um, how each, so here you can see that each line of intervention. So the first green arrow um, on the left blue box is a write. That is we're setting some layers output to zero and the next is a read and the, th and the third is also um, a read. But you see here we use the dot save because we do um, want it's, this value to be sent over the network when the model is not running. And you see the output of this is this intervention graph in the middle. And this is basically what is, what is what is sent over the network in one direction. And then the result for things that we ask the model, that we ask the graph to save, are then sent back in the other direction when the execution is done. Um, again, just to remind ourselves on, on what we're trying to do now, we have an idea of what our library looks like and how we use it, is that uh, we want to passing some context, we want to run it. Remember, we're only interested in what happens by the column. So we'll be indexing to get only the, the excuse me, the vector at the very extreme end. Because like the idea is that is the token that will contain information on what is to come next, right? Again, just as a result of how um, transform architectures work is the next prediction is contained in the last token. To what end do we want to do that? To this end. So we could do two sets of runs. The first run is to um, pass a bunch of examples doing the task we want. Um, again, just, just this is exactly like how you would tell um, chat GPT something like, um, I want you to give me words and opposite, like this example, old, young, separated by colon, then that, 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 then it does its thing, right? So this is basically just like um, um, prompting it with, with the, um, this is similar to prompting with the format of code you want, but in this case, we're actually just going to um, look at the very last token and then right before it's, when it's right on the verge of predicting, we just take, after it's done all the computation to, to know that, okay, this is a word and opposite game we're playing and I am to predict the opposite of the last thing I saw before this token. 
So right when it's supposedly figured all that out, we want to just snatch that vector and average a bunch of them out to get hopefully a vector that represents in some pure form uh, the very essence of the task that it has figured out, which is opposite function of previous. Um, so that's the first experiment. That's the first part of the experiment. Then the second part of the experiment is to take this pure vector and then add it to a different context, um, a different series of examples that supposedly should have no idea what is going on, right? Because again, if you just told ChatGPT and code column dot dot dots, like it has no idea what you want is, you know, it can't read your mind uh, yet. So um, this is called the zero shot um, intervention, which basically just means zero shot means. Um, zero examples of what you're looking for, except now we're going to add um, this hopefully um, averaged out function. You know, has it just, again, feel compelled to do the thing that that vector was obtained from. Right, so how do we do the first part? That is the, the part where we just run a bunch of stuff and we extract the value at the very last column for all of them and average out. Um, Cool, so again, we have our, our trusted layout. Of course, first of all, we have to determine what component we want to look at. Remember, uh, interp is all about um, having an observed, an interesting observed behavior and trying to find the contribution of some discrete component, right? So in this case, we narrow down by saying, okay, okay, we want to look at layer eight again. In the actual experiment, we run this for all the different layers, for all the different components in the model. And then we have like a plot of which of them happen to be most interesting. And then we drill down. But this is just showing an example of suppose we wanted to see what layer eight was doing as far as this task is concerned. Um, cool. So just imagine this done you know, for a bunch of tens of other components. Cool. So we have a runner in Boger, then. Here, on line six, we simply just um, do our trusted as we would like to. Notice here that I don't do the, the dot save because this value of hitting states, this variable, is only needed for computation inside of um, my context, right? So I do not need to export this at, at this very point in time. I just simply need to um, have the take the variable, hold on to it, use it for other computation on line 10. Um, and as you can see, line six is simply just the rightmost column. That is, a, um, sorry, beg your pardon. That is um, the on, right. So between line six and seven, we simply just take an example, we choose a layer, and on line eight, we say the sequence position should be, I think on line one, you see we define that as minus one. So we just simply want to take the very last value, which is the token. So again, all the dark gray bars is what line eight um, is holding on to. Then on line 10, we simply just do the average. So we take that variable and we do the dot mean on the batch dimension. That's the zeroth dimension. Again, that's the dimension of all the stacked examples. On the right there, I think I just put like a clip out to show you what the um, vectors and, and, make, and um, matrix here look like. So like each of those stacks is just the batch dimension. So each of the examples um, of old, young, awake, asleep is represented by one of these like slices. Um, and we simply just want to average across that to get some hopefully pure vector that encodes the essence of opposites. Um, and that we want to save because that we want to send back. So like it's kind of meant to be an efficient thing such that we don't want to send everything over the network. We don't want to send both the full, all the matrices. Technically we could send, we could decide to save everything and then compute locally. So again, this is just some of the considerations that you make when you remind yourself that actually, you know, there is uh, some throughput cost and efficiency costs. So like, let's just do as much as we can on this uh, this environment, and then just send down the most condensed version we want. Um, again, this is um, should be similar to like running using any like remote resource, or when you have trade offs between remote and local resources to contend with. Um, cool. So. That is how we do the first part. That's how we get the averages. Literally, this is all to do averages for one layer. And then just imagine putting this in a for loop if you want to like iterate over several layers. And for the second part, having possessed this um, average pure vector, which we called H, we want to then put H into our zero shot examples. Again, these are the examples that have no context on the task. 
they're just doing their own thing. They um, supposedly oblivious to the the task we find interesting of opposites. Um, but from nowhere, they will just feel the urge to now just do opposites. Hopefully, if we add this average vector state to them. Um, and here is the example I mentioned where we're running two invoker contexts inside of the runner context. Um, so basically, we, the first is the, again, we're trying to, as with any experiment, we you know have to have like our control example or like our reference or our baseline to say that, cool, without adding this average vector, what does the model feel compelled to predict? So for simple, does it feel um, compelled to predict simple simpler? Maybe it just says, cool, simpler should be something to follow simple. Or given encode, does it feel compelled to predict um, base64? Or perhaps it does feel naturally compelled to decode, who knows? Um, so the first run on line four and five is just, again, simply running the model and dot saving the output um, for the very last token. Um, and the second is where we do the interesting stuff of running the model and basically intervening. So on line 11, we literally just plus equals two, um, which is identical to how we were taking the mean before. But again, for this context, we just do it plus equals two, add this value um, to the existing um, and on line 13, we, again, just like line five, dot save to see, okay, cool. Now let's see what the predictions are and how similar they are, um, or to what extent this um, vector has changed the opinions um, of this model. Results. Um, I mean, depending on your standards for um, impressive or not, this is what it looks like. This is what run one looks like. Just by doing that, we can see that indeed, on the third column here, um, adding that H vector does move the needle a bit, does have, um, does have the effect of the opposite function, right? So on the second column, we just see that the thing the model tries to do, if you tell the model, if you tell the model minimum column, it just repeats a lot of stuff, right? So it just says minimum is minimum. Arrogant is arrogant, inside is inside. Although sometimes it does interesting things like um, the fifth example from the bottom, if you say on, it says I. If you say answer, it says yes. Um, again, this is what the model feels compelled to just say if it has no context. Um, but on the third column, we see that um, in some examples, um, we do manage to, to, to tilt its, its final judgment in a different direction. Now, um, I will mention though, that this is technically not where the paper stops. The paper decides to say beyond just averaging H, remember like this is taking the value of the output of the entire layer. Remember, we just see layer eight. Um, the paper takes it further by saying, okay, instead of just looking at layer eight, can we drill specifically into what component in layer eight is contributing? So back to our reference architecture, neural network um, transformer component, a transformer block has different things, or attention block rather, excuse me, um, has the mass self-attention, the feed forward, it has different things, um, layer norm, and they decide to drill into the contributions of the attention head. Again, the distinction isn't that important, but the experiment, experimental method is precisely the same. So they just find a way to drill into studying the contribution of the top um, X attention heads. And instead of averaging, looking for the average of just all the, the components contributions, which again, supposedly will have more noise, they basically try to denoise by just narrowing it in on a few. And with that, the effect is way more obvious, but I don't include that for the purpose of this talk. And that was the talk. So if you are interested in looking at the NDIF um, project and NN Insight Library as well, which is a companion, please view that site. Um, and if you're interested in learning more on Mechinterp, um, many of the um, code snippets and basically concepts introduced today were introduced to myself on the platform called arena.education. It is an awesome program. You should check it out if you're interested in learning more on doing mechanistic interpretability. Um, I hope you've had as much fun going through this as I have and do enjoy the rest of the conference.